Uh, good evening and welcome to this WSET Bite Size on what is Calvados. My name's Ed. I'm a wine and spirit educator at the WSET School in London. Uh, the WSET is the leading provider of wine, spirit and sake qualifications. And I'm proud to announce that in February 2024, we'll be launching our qualifications in beer as well. We offer all our courses through a network of over 800 approved programme providers in over 70 countries and in 15 languages. Uh, to find out more and to sign up for one of our qualifications, then please visit our Where to Study page at wsetglobal.com. Uh, uh, a few housekeeping points before I introduce our speaker. Uh, this session is going to be recorded and will be later available on demand at our WSET Events Hub YouTube channel where you can enjoy all our previous webinars on demand. Um, please use the question and answer box to submit any questions uh, and we will answer as many of these as we can at the end of the presentation. And at the end of the presentation we'll also be sending out a short feedback survey. Uh, it'll be great to hear your thoughts on how to shape our future events. Um, so without further ado, our speaker today is Rose Brugman, who apart from having the great honour of teaching me my level three award <laughs> in spirits, uh, runs the mixing class, which is the world's leading independent supplier of WSET spirit qualifications. Um, over to you, Rose. Thank you, Ed. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Rose. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about Calvados. So I've been in the hospitality industry for about 18 years and I've been running WSET spirit courses for uh, around five years now. And I love Calvados uh, because Calvados is made with one of my favourite raw materials, and that is apples. Um, I'm from the UK. I'm calling from London now. And uh, it's one of the only fruits we're really good at making in the UK. So it's a shame we don't have more apple brandies here. Uh, but we're going to talk about one of the most famous ones, which is Calvados. So we're going to talk a little bit about how Calvados uh, is made, a little bit about its history, and then we're going to end on a little bit of how uh, we drink it. Um, I am drinking a lovely uh, Dupont Calvados today, well, a twist on a Calvados. Um, if you're drinking anything, please let us know in the chat or the Q&A what you're drinking or what your favourite Calvados is. So let's get started with what is Calvados? Well, Calvados is a spirit made from apples and pears. Sometimes it's all apples, sometimes it's all pears, and sometimes it's a mixture. It's always aged in oak. We're going to look at the different barrel sizes when we talk about the post-distillation operations. It's made in France. I'm going to show you some maps in a minute of, exact, of exactly where it is made. And it's protected by three separate appellations. Now, uh, you might have heard of GIs, geographical indications. This is the European way of protecting a spirit category. It doesn't just have to be spirits. It could be food. It can be textiles. But it's saying here it, it's made here. And this is why important the place and the people, um, or why they're important to its production. The AOC, the Appellation to Origin Control A, is the French version of that GI. And they're very, very, very restrictive on, on production, um, highly legislated for um, to protect the spirit categories. Now, Calvados has three AOCs. The first is the Calvados AOC. The second is Pédage AOC. And the third is Calvados de Fonte. Uh, I do want to apologize for my French pronunciation as well. Um, I don't speak French fluently. I wish I did, um, but I'm really sorry if I'm offending anyone. But. Um, the appellation for Calvados actually covers a million hectares and it's got over three million trees in it. So it covers a really big area. Uh, so let's have a look at some maps of France. Here's France on the left here. And these are the fruit spirit regions of France. Now, these are not the only protections in France for spirits, but these are the three main ones for fruit. Cognac was the first region to get an AOC, quickly followed by Armagnac in the 1930s. And then Calvados got his first protection in 1942. Uh, on the right here, we have a picture of the Calvados region. Now, these regions are showing us exactly where our raw material can be grown for production. So the whole area in green, that is the Calvados AOC. The other two AOCs, Pédage is a slightly smaller one that covers this region. This is where our raw material must be grown for Pédage. Uh, and here is the De Fonte region. Now, Pédage, this region um, makes up about 29% of production, the De Fronte, about 1%, and the whole of the rest of the Calvados region, that makes up about 70% of production. So three very different regions. Uh, Pédage is protected and well known for the traditional styles, um, using for very traditional methods. De Fronte, that was given protection because it's use of pears and perry. 
Amazing. So the Interprofession de Appellation Sidricole, again, apologies, uh, the IDAC, um, this is the um, body that looks after Calvados. It doesn't just look after Calvados, it looks after the pear and apple brandy and uh, ciders um, in the regions of France. Um, and here's a couple of stats for them to give you a good idea of kind of the size of Calvados. Now, Calvados sold 4.8 million bottles in 2021 compared to, Cal uh, to Cognac. Um, they sold 250 million bottles. So it gives you kind of an idea of the size of how much smaller than cognac it is. Um, and actually, Armagnac is a very similar size uh, to Calvados production. They sold about 5 million bottles in 2020. Um, export accounts for about 50% of all sales of Calvados, and it's exported to over 90 different countries. Now, Germany drinks about 14% of um export sales Belgium about eight percent the UK where I live only drinks about two percent of those sales um sad we need to drink more in my opinion uh, but yes so it gives you a nice outline of uh the Calvados region now let's just touch on the history quickly the history of Calvados where did it come from um well the area in Normandy it's always been well known for the production of cider uh, and perries um and for the geeky people who like the climate stuff um and terroir um this region has got soil that's made of flint and clay so it's very good at retaining water uh, but actually there's a lot of rivers that allow for that drainage to happen um it's on the coast it gets quite different summers so the climate changes very quickly in the summer um, but it gets gulf winds which are warm they're moist and that means winters are quite mild um, and because there's winds as well this actually helps with um, infection or pests insects diseases that sort of thing it really limits them but for a really long time they were growing lots of uh, apples and pears, making lots of lovely ciders and perries, but it wasn't until 1553 that cider was first distilled in the region, uh, supposedly by Lord Guberville was the first person to uh, distill. And actually it was written by um, in a, a guy called Charles Pico's Diaries. He would uh, write about lots of different things he was doing, looking after orchids, all of his hobbies. And one of them was distillation, which he did with his friends uh, and supposedly was the first person to distill cider into apple brandy. And actually, obviously, it became very popular because by 1606, Normandy distillers had created their own corporation, a guild um, to move forward and protect the category. But for a really long time, nothing else really happened in Calvados um, in, in relation to laws. But obviously, a lot of stuff happened in France. Uh, colonization happened. France spread around the world. So did trade. Um, and then in 1790, uh, we had the French Revolution. Uh, and after 1790, Calvados um, was given the name. The Department of Calvados was created in Normandy. Um, then... There was a really long time before it actually became officially Calvados. So Parisians started drinking it. They started recognising it. They started giving it the name Calvados, this apple brandy, as a really casual name for the region and for the spirit. Uh, and then it wasn't until uh, in 1942 that we got the official name in law and the first AOC, which was for Pédage. Um, the 20 years previous to this uh, had been the wars or the World War One and the lead up to World War Two, um, And the government had a monopoly on alcohol. So they actually forced all of the spirit producers to start making neutral spirit for weapons production. Uh, and the locals were very worried that they would lose their uh, tradition of making these spirits. And so campaigned and got the AOC protected. Uh, at the same time, 10 other regions became the Calvados AOR, which is uh, not quite an AOC, but still had regulations uh, and protections. This was updated in 1984 when all of those that AOR became the AOC of Calvados. Uh, and then the last protection came in in 1997 for De Fonte to really recognize its use of pears and perries in production. So we're going to look at how we make it now. And if you've ever studied with the WSET uh, for spirits uh, specifically, we like to look at production in, in four stages, raw material, fermentation, distillation, and post distillation. So we're going to go through those four now, and we're going to start with our raw material, which hopefully by now is obvious, apples and pears. These are our raw material, and these are cider varieties, apples and pears. So which means they're very small. Cooking apples, very big. Eating apples, middle size. Cider varieties, very, very small. There are over 6,000 varieties in the Calvados region, but they 
all break down, well, the apples do, they break down into four categories. Uh, and it's our recipe, our blending of these categories together that is going to make our final product. It's very similar to making a mash bill. So if you're into whiskey, especially American whiskey, we'll have our mash bill, our recipe of grains that will affect the flavor of the final product. And it's the same here. So bittersweet apples, these are apples uh, that are very well balanced. They make the base of what you're going to ferment. You've then got bitter apples. These provide tannin and they provide body behind the spirit. We've got acidic. Um, these give freshness. And then we've got sweet. Uh, these provide flavor and they're also going to provide a large amount of sugar. And we need sugar to make alcohol. Pears are also going to do very similar to the sweet. They're going to add flavor and they're going to introduce more sugar into that mixture of raw material. Now, these are harvested, uh, the annual harvest, and they har are generally harvested in four batches from September to December, sometimes even into January. And this is going to be based on variety. Now, harvesting can be done by hand or machine. If you do it by hand, maybe you're just picking them up off the floor as they fall off the tree. Maybe you're poking the tree with a stick. They're going to fall out into your basket. Or my favorite way, the machine. This is a tractor. This is very cool. If anyone's been into the streets of Seville, you might have seen these at a certain time of year. But the tractor has arms that grab onto the tree trunk and out pops an umbrella, an upside down umbrella. And the tractor vibrates the tree so all the apples fall off and you collect them in the umbrella and take them uh, to processing. I really like this because I don't know if anyone watches Midsummer Murders. It's a very quaint murder mystery TV show based in the south of the UK. And someone got murdered by being shaken to death by one of those machines. Um, would recommend. Great TV show. Good Sunday afternoon watching. It's not scary or anything. Mild peril. That's all it is. Anyway. Um, so there we go. We're harvesting our raw material. Next stage, fermentation. So fermentation is where we add yeast and create alcohol, specifically ethanol, that's the alcohol we want, and flavor. Now fermentation, we do have some laws around this. It's a minimum of 4.5% ABV after fermentation. ABV, alcohol by volume, um, that would be nine proof in the States. So minimum of 4.5% after fermentation. Now there are minimum fermentation times. For Calvados, for Pédage, minimum of 21 days, which is actually quite a long time for spirits categories. Um, globally, you're looking at whiskey kind of 24, 48, maybe a little bit longer. So to say 21 days and de fronte 30 days is quite a while. And some people even leave it up to a year before they finish fermentation. Uh, now, what's something that's not allowed in this category is chaptalization. Now, this is the addition of sugar. Um, we're not allowed to do that. If you add sugar, you're going to increase your yield at the end. And we don't want to do that. Most people want a lower ABV. And we're looking at kind of more like five to six percent ABV after fermentation. Um, if we compare that to like the cognacs and the armagnacs, we're looking more like kind of seven to nine percent ABV. Um, yeah. So. The way we're going to make this is that we're going to get our fruit. We're going to grate it. We're going to mash it up and then we're going to leave it to sit for about four hours and then we're going to press it to get that juice. The solids are going to be got rid of and um, they're going to probably be fed to livestock. You do see some people flushing water through the solids to get the last of those sugars, but a lot of people don't like to do that because they think it loses concentration of flavor. Now, there is something cool that happens after about three or five days, um, and that's the pectin. It starts to coagulate and it rises to the top of the fermentation and it causes what's known as a brown hat. And that kind of allows for really slow, stable fermentation to happen. Now, Calvados is a mixture of apples and pears. Now, there are rules that we aren't covering. I'm just going to flag that. There are a lot of rules we're not, we don't have time to cover today. Uh, but the basics are Calvados, apples and pears. Pédage is a maximum of 30% pears, and De Fonte is a minimum of 30% pears. Some of these can be up to 100% pears. Now, with the De Fonte, you're not allowed to add anything that's going to slow down or speed up fermentation. So we're not allowed to use sulfur dioxide. We're not allowed to use nutrients or anything like that. So fermentation. Next stage distillation. This is how we make it into a spirit. Distillation is where we're using heat to separate what we want from what we don't want. So distillation, um, you've got the choice of pot or column stills in the Calvados region. Um, we've got a picture here of a pot still, we've got a picture here of a traveling column still as well. These are very cool. Now, the basics of pot still distillation, it's a direct fired still. It's a pot still. We're going to put our um, fermented alcoholic 
alcoholic liquid into that pot. We're going to turn the still, we're going to heat it up. Vapor will rise up the still into our condenser where it will cool down back into a liquid. The idea of the first distillation is to get rid of things that we don't want, like a lot of water. There are things that do not go through distillation. So color, any bits and bits that might still be left in uh, the fermentation. And what we have is something called uh, little water, petit eau, which is about 30% ABV. We're going to put that into a pot still for the second distillation. Might be a different one, might be the same pot still. But the second distillation we works exactly the same. We turn it on, vapor appears, goes up the still, through the line arm across into the condenser and we collect it. But on this distillation, we're going to do what's called cutting. And that's where we decide what to keep. The first stuff that comes off the still is called the heads. This is full of things that we don't like. Methanol is one of the key ones. Methanol we need to cut out from our spirits because if you decide to drink it, you'll go blind or die. So we do need to cut that out. Otherwise, you will have no returning customers and that's not fun. So we make a cut and all that uh, involves is starting to collect in a second tank. That's where we're going to collect the heart. The heart is the stuff that we like. It's full of all of the ethanol we like, all of the flavors that we like from the raw material, from fermentation. Um, and towards the end of the distillation, we're going to make a cut to the tails. Again, tails is full of stuff we don't like, things like propanol, butanol, fusel alcohols, unpleasant flavors. So we've got the heart and the heart is the bit we want. That is the bit we're going to take forward to post-distillation operations. Now, the maximum distillation strength for Calvados across the board is 72% ABV. This is very similar to Cognac and Armagnac, where it's both 72.4%. So these are going to create quite pronounced spirits. Now, the column still still creates quite a pronounced spirit. Um, and it works by you heat the cider up before it goes into the still in what's known as the cider heater imaginatively named. Uh, and that cider is going to be heated up. It's going to enter the column still, very much like an Armagnac distillation. The first part of the column still is to get rid of uh, the bits we don't want. So the water, anything that doesn't turn into vapor, so color, any bits. And it will go through this column and then into a second column, which was is going to then sort out the head, the heart and the tail for us. And we're going to have three different taps to pull off head, heart and tail. Now, there is a limitation on this one as well. You're allowed to put through about 250 hectolitres in 24 hours through these stills, which is still quite a bit, but that does control production. And um, these are continuous stills, the column stills, so you can keep them running as long as you want. Now, Pedage, you are only allowed to use double pot still distillation. When it comes to Dufronti, you are limited to using the column still only, and you're allowed a maximum of 28 plates. Now, plates are part of a column still that allow you to get better separation and a more refined spirit, but 28 plates isn't a huge number in the grand scheme of distillation. So there we go, distillation. At the end of this, we will have our lovely spirit ready to go into post-distillation, um, our final stage of production. So post-distillation, what are we allowed to do? Well, we have to put it in oak containers. That's one of the laws, oak containers. Um, and we're allowed to use different sizes. Sometimes you see quite small uh, barrels. These can be 254, even 600 liters. They're relatively small. But then we have the foodra. These are between one and 10,000 liters. These are really big. This picture really doesn't do justice how big these are. Um, and there's a couple of interactions that happen in the barrel. Um, and the size of the barrel is going to have an effect. The key one is surface area and interaction with the oak. So when you put a spirit into the oak, that spirit will be absorbed by the oak and pushed out and absorbed and pushed out. It's like the oak is breathing it. And as it gets breathed out, that spirit is going to extract stuff from the wood. Now, if you've got a small barrel, you've got more surface area interacting with the spirit, which means you can have more flavors. We're going to be looking at things like vanilla, baking spices, clove, maybe some nuts, maybe some caramel. On a bigger barrel, you've got less surface area. So you're going to have a much more subtle oak character to it. Another thing is angel share. Hopefully you've all heard of the angel share. You leave your stuff in the barrel, come back to it several years later and see that a chunk was missing. So you thought the angels had come down and taken their share, but in the process had touched the spirit and made it taste amazing. If you've got a bigger barrel, you're going to lose less to the angel share. If you've got a smaller barrel, you're going to lose more. But the angel share generally is around 2% uh, in the Calvados region, which isn't too dissimilar to some of the other French products. Um, but stuff that evaporates out, anything that's left is going to concentrate. So your flavor is going to concentrate, your color is going to concentrate. And so the longer you leave it in barrel, the more concentration of flavor you're going to have. We could see more development of flavor as well with the longer uh, time in barrel as oxygen gets in and creates lovely complexity. 
So the rules for barrel aging or for oak aging rather, Calvados and Paydage is a minimum of two years, whereas De Fronte, a minimum of three years. There's a couple of other things we can do post distillation, by the way. Uh, adding caramel coloring is allowed. Adding sweetener is allowed. We're probably going to use apple juice to do that. Um, and uh, you can add a small amount of sweet, uh, well, sweetener, as I said, uh, coloring and water. These are the three things that we can add uh, post distillation. There are uh, very limits, uh, strict limits on the amount of everything you're allowed to add. Uh, yeah. So labeling terms. Uh, if anyone works with any of the French products, uh, you will know uh, French spirits. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of labeling terms. Um, so let's see if any of you remember these. Um, maybe think back to cognac or armagnac if you studied it. Maybe look at your rum agricoles. But VS, very special. Trois pommes, three apples. I love that labeling term. Trois étoiles, three stars. Love that labeling term as well. These all are labeling terms used for spirits that are a minimum of two years old. That's the youngest these spirits can be. Well, for Calvados and, uh, and Pédage. Then we've got Vu and Reserve, two labeling terms that we can use for three years old. This is the youngest that De Fontaine can be. Then we've got the VO, very old. VSOP, very superior old pale. Veal Reserve, four years. And then lastly, we've got XO, extra old. Ordage, beyond age. Trey Veal Reserve, Trey Vu and Napoleon. These are all six years old. If it does have an age statement on the bottle, the age statement is the youngest part of the blend. And uh, there's another one, uh, non reduit. Uh, that means no water is added, so it's essentially cast strength. Now, we've learned about how we make it, um, and maybe you've got a very lovely Calvados at home. We can taste the apple from the raw material, the pear from the raw material. We can taste the fruity fermentation flavors as well that are really going to enhance that fruitiness. We can taste the barrel, the vanilla, the baking spices. Maybe it tastes like apple turnover or pastry. Well, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to drink it? Well, great idea to start with as an aperitif or a digestif. Drink it on its own. Drink it with coffee after dinner. Great way to appreciate some of these spirits, especially if you're new to it. This one's fun. A true normand. This means Norman Hole. Um, what you do is you have a Calvados between each course as a palate cleanser. Maybe I suggest this for uh, Christmas Day uh, as a good start. Maybe give it a go. See how the family feel about it. Maybe buy a selection of them and have a different one for each course. <laughs> Now, one that's really relevant for this season is hot mulled cider. Now, as Ed said, um, I ran the mixing class. If you head over to our Instagram page last week, I posted a recipe for hot mulled cider, um, cider, apple juice, Calvados. My recipe did have gin in it. If you fancy putting another booze in it, if not, take that out, put in more Calvados. Um, and then I recommend putting something to keep it nice and warm and spicy. So fresh chilies ginger and whatever spices you fancy star anise nutmeg cinnamon cassia uh, options are endless i would recommend heating up um, on the hob but don't make it boil just make it warm um, a really nice one to have at this time of year now if you prefer classic cocktails the sidecar is well known as a cognac cocktail so cognac lemon juice and orange liqueur very nice sort out the cognac stick in calvados instead really nice classic easy to make cocktail and this one I haven't actually tried, but I read about it and I really want to try it because I love cider. Um, ice cider top, make a slush puppy with your cider, open up your cider, stick it in the freezer, make it into a slush puppy, stick it in a glass with a straw and then on top uh, pour some Calvados. Very nice. Desperate to try that when summer comes. If you're interested in learning more about Calvados, obviously you can book onto the WSET courses. We learn about it at level um, two and three. Um, but here's a couple of things that I've used as really good resources. The Calvados book uh, by Henrik Matson. It is a little bit older now, um, but it's got some really great information there about the history, um, how it's made and the different brands. Uh, the IDAC, now this is where I got a lot of my information from, a lot of my stats from and the photos from. This is a great website. And then Drink Calvados is a great website. Um, but yeah, there are loads of good Calvadoses out there. I do have to recommend one if you're not really sure where to start in the UK. Um, Avalon is a really good one, um, specifically as they're lo looking from the sustainability angle uh, and the um, saving of the bees. They use, uh, they're making uh, paper bottles 
or card bottles, I suppose. And you can get that at most retailers and it's very affordable. So if you're looking a nice one to start off your collection, I definitely recommend that. Uh, but Ed and I are very lucky today to be drinking a Dupont. Have you tried it yet? And what are your thoughts? Uh, Rose, thank you so much for, for giving me a sample. It is absolutely delicious. Like super fresh, super fruity. Uh, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I really like it. So this technically, if it's in a Calvados, I cheated a bit. This is an Eau de Vie de Cidre. It's been finished in a Corona cask, um, which means it's not a Calvados, but it's 100% apples, a pay d'age. Uh, they make it on pot stills and it's aged for six years in toasted 400 litre barrels. 25% um, of them are new. And then it's aged for five months in 220 litre Corona rum casks. Lovely cooked apple, stewed apple. But it's got this kind of underlying sugar, herbaceous, grassy note to it, which, uh, yeah. Really lovely. Yeah, it's it's so, like uh, it's almost like a dessert in itself. It's it's not sweet, but it has that kind of like tart tatan, like caramel sugar kind of coating. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, really, really love it. Um, so uh, we've got a few questions that have come through uh, since you've been speaking. So uh, a question about yeast um, and um, is cultured yeast always added, or is it possible to ferment with only indigenous yeasts like wine? So what typically happens is that people are using ambient wild yeast. And actually, it wasn't until very recently in the grand scheme of the Calvados that you could actually use culture yeast. Uh, so it's still a very uh, new thing. So a lot of them, especially people like Pédage and Defronte, are still working without adding yeast, um, which is quite exciting. And why we're looking at in interesting flavours and long fermentations. Yeah. Um, the next question, uh, does the brown cap during fermentation function uh, similar to floor in sherry, uh, where it protects the juice from oxidation or spoilage. I'm going to say I don't know the answer to that question because I know nothing about wine. Um, <laughs> so, Ed, do you know? Uh, you so what I would say is like most of the time when you're having a active fermentation, you're already quite protected from oxygen because carbon dioxide is going to be produced as a byproduct. Mm -hmm. And that's going to form almost like a... a a layer, uh, carbon dioxide being heavier than oxygen, is going to is going to exclude oxygen from that fermentation. Once fermentation is finished, then you need to be worried about oxidation. So maybe it's uh, it's as it is to protect it. So maybe it's because we're having such long fermentations, you don't want other bacteria and stuff to land on it and start creating flavour. So it does create a, it's meant to create a stable. Um, so maybe that is something to do with it. But it's a really good question, uh, and yeah, I need to do more research on that because that is a yeah great question. I would I would say that it would it would be acting as a, as a bar barrier as well. Yeah. So it's it's extra protection is always always good, right? Um, next question about oak. Uh, is there a specific wood permitted for oak aging? For example, um, cognac uh, has an association with limousine oak. Uh, does it specify the type of oak or can other woods be used? It's got to be oak. I'm assuming it's French oak. That is part of the AOC that I haven't read, but with all of the French OOCs, they're pretty much very strict on the type of oak you have to use. So I imagine it is written in there, uh, the type of oak that is expected to be used or the variation of oak. And I imagine it is French oak only, which is why this is, doesn't count as a Calvados because we put it into a different barrel. Um, yeah. Interesting. Um, question. Next one about producers. Do they typically disclose the kind of makeup of apples versus pears? Um, um, beside the AOC rules, is the ratio based on flavor or cost or, or what have you um i think they do and i think you can find out that information the big producers it's probably harder to and typically you you're using those kind of typical numbers typically using about 70 percent of those bitter sweet um 20 percent acidic and 10 percent bitter um I think the smaller producers are much more likely to shout about it um and the bigger producers are probably less likely so but that information is going to be available i think yeah, for, for example, the flavor. one that we were uh, we're, we're currently enjoying, uh, yeah. I did check on the website earlier, and it did have a kind of breakdown of their uh, their usage. So um, yeah, check the most producer the websites is where you'd look yeah. for that kind of information. Um, very good. Um, what is the average kind of ABV you'd find in a Calvados? Oh, 40 percent. So we're looking full spirit, 40, 42, something like that. That's all the ones I've been having is what we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah, full strength spirits. Um, and uh, could you just go over again the kind of big export markets for Calvados? Oh, yes. So the biggest is Germany. 
Um, let me see how many I've got written down. I've got a couple of written down. The IDAC website is great for this information. They've got a whole pie chart you can go and have a look at. So go check that out. Uh, but the key ones I picked out, um, France drink 50% of it. Germany drink 40%. Belgium 8%. Yeah, those are the key ones I picked out. Uh, but you can go and see that fun uh, pie chart um, in on the IDAC website. Yeah. Um, and then other questions. Who are the, the, the biggest and best producers that we should go in? Um, yeah, that's out? a great question. So DuPont is one I, ca I come across. Uh, Christian Druin, uh, very nice. Um, Avalon, I said, is very interesting. That's a kind of a relatively new UK brand. Uh, but what I recommend is heading to the Calvados website, uh, calvados.fr, and the other ones that I advertised, um, Drink Calvados. Um, and you can see a map. And they actually, this is like the dream that I'm going to definitely do next year. I keep saying this, is to cycle. They show a cycle route. And um, that is going to take you through some of the really big producers plus some of the really small producers. And it's a really good route you can do on a bike. Obviously take a couple of days and don't get drunk while doing it. Don't recommend that. Um, but stop in different places and you should be able to hit some of the really big producers and, you know, a nice variety there of styles. You can hire a tandem. That sounds great. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm totally. Do that now. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Rose. That was really excellent, really informative. Uh, thank you so much for everyone also who's attended this evening. Uh, remember, webinar recordings will be available on our events hub. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up to date uh, with all our on-demand events. Um, and to, again, just to reiterate, if you're interested in studying with the WSCT uh, to sign up for one of our qualifications in spirits or, or, or other categories, uh, please visit our Where to Study page at wsctglobal.com and they'll find your local provider. Um, and thank you so much and have a, a lovely day.